Whose life would be better if you knew more C++? Whose life would be better if your coworkers knew more C++? Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Back to Basics Compiling and Linking. I'm Ben Sachs. Um, if you don't know me, my company, Sachs & Associates, offers training in C and C++ uh, for companies all over the world. Uh, particularly, we, we deal a lot in the embedded space in particular. So, <sighs> compiling and linking. Why are, we, why are we talking about this? Well, I mean, it's stuff we all have to do. But there are things that you know, understanding the compilation model can be very helpful for understanding why we write programs in certain ways, how to fix certain bugs, things like that. So in general, uh, our programs consist of, by the way, I realize that I'm going starting really basic here. I, I th That's always the trick with these back to basics talks is how basic, but I think we'll get on to stuff that's a little bit more advanced fairly quickly. Um, it, by the way, you, you should feel free to ask questions at any time in the Q&A. Um, we do have the ability to, uh, to open up a mic and let you speak as well, uh, but do be aware that you'll be on the recording if you do that, so. Um, just, just so you're aware. Okay, so we have header files and we have source files, which usually, technically, they don't even have to be text files, but that's that's what I'm going to assume that they are for the purposes of this discussion. That's usually what we're talking about. So one of the things that we write a lot of in our in our header files and our source files is declarations. And we declare all sorts of different things, functions, namespaces, objects. I'm going to refer to these all under the blanket heading of entities because I'm going to be talking a lot about things that are true of declarations in general and definitions in general. And I need a, I need a somewhat vague term like entities to do that. Now, we have a lot of conventions about where what we put in our source files and what we put in our header files, but those are just conventions. They're not specific rules that are codified in the standard. The standard really doesn't say very much about source files and header files at all. Uh, it, it really talks in terms of other constructs, in particular, what we call a translation unit. But there are certain conventions that most of us are familiar with. When we're dealing with functions, we often declare them in header files so that they will be available to many different, so that that declaration is visible in many different source files. We put a definition for the function in a corresponding source file that tells the compiler what it's actually going to generate. But we do things differently for functions that are inline in, or const expert or const eval, which are functions that are implicitly inline. When we're writing any of those kinds of functions, we define them in their entirety in the header file. And that's just, that's it. There's the definition is in the header file. We don't need to put anything in the source file. So these conventions exist because you know, they're best practices that people have developed over time for helping us write software effectively, avoid having to do a lot of unnecessary maintenance and things like that. But, um, and a lot of us are familiar with the basic rules, but there are also a lot of special cases that don't really fit into the general guidelines where people tend it, that are things we don't do very often where it's harder to remember. Uh, okay, yeah, we have a question. Why not define all functions in headers? What's the disadvantage? Um, well, th th I think the main disadvantage 
uh, is we'll talk about uh, about some of the aspects here, but uh, I think the big one is that since the function's implementation is in your header file, um, if you go to change anything that the function does, you've now changed the header file, which can be a dependency for lots of different source files, which means you're faced with the idea of recompiling a lot bigger portion of your code than you might have had to uh, if you were, if you'd put the function body in a single source file. Okay. Um, yeah, so these special cases, they can be a little bit hard to remember. And sometimes when we get them wrong, we get compile or link errors, but we can also get strange cases of undefined behavior, or it can just be that we get code that's not as fast as we would like, or that takes a lot longer to build than we would prefer. So, and I think a lot of C++ programmers don't really memorize these special cases. Instead, they have an understanding of how the compiler and the linker work to build the program. And they rely on that understanding to fill in the gaps when they run into something that they maybe haven't done for a little while. And that's what we're, we're going to be talking about here. All right, so starting off, declarations and definitions. So these are two terms that we use quite a bit. A lot of people use them either interchangeably or they're, they're easy to mix up because they sound very similar, declarations and definitions. And almost certainly during this talk, uh, you'll hear me say definition because it's an easy mistake to make, but they are different things. Um, I, I, well, I thought I had answered the, the question about defining functions in header files. If I haven't, by all means, uh, let me know with a, with a follow-up and I will do the best I can. Um, but yeah, it's the, I was, the concern that I, the thing that I tend to think is a reason not to put for all function definitions in headers is uh, all of your code is now in header files, which causes you to, uh, to maybe need to rebuild a lot more of your program because header files are used in many more places. A change to a header file can make, make you recompile several source files. Okay, so declarations and definitions. A declaration introduces a name into the program and it associates certain aspects with that name. It might be the name of a function, it might be the name of an object, could be the name of a um, of a namespace or other things, all of those can be declared. When you're writing a declaration, that just introduces the name. It doesn't necessarily say what, that the entity is right here. That's something that a declaration or that a definition does. See, already right there. Uh, a definition is a more complete declaration that gives you the name the full set of information about the entity that's being defined and the uh, and it says that entity exists right here. This is the place in the program where it is being defined. So all definitions are declarations. If you're providing all of the information about something, you're providing some of the information about something but there are declarations that are not definitions. Uh, I will refer to non-defining declarations in some, case, in some cases. All right, so, and this is a big deal, difference. This affects a lot of what goes in header files versus source files. So this is a function declaration. Um, if you, this is, a, it just, declares the name of the function, the parameter list, the return value. 
It doesn't have the function body, so it's not a definition. It's a non-defining declaration. This tells the compiler everything that it needs to know to call this function. It, kn it knows what the function is expecting to receive in from the outside and what it expects to give back as a return value. But it doesn't tell the compiler what the function itself is actually going to do. It can't generate the code to execute the function. That's what a function definition fills in. In a function definition, we, has, we have the brace enclosed body that tells us exactly what the function is supposed to do. That lets the compiler actually create the code for that function to execute when that function is called. In C++, when we're talking about object declarations, often they are definitions as well. In general, you have to go a little out of your way to write an object declaration that is not a definition. So typically, when we write just int i, that's a definition for an integer called i. If we want something that's only a declaration, then you, we have to qualify it with the keyword extern. That says, that simply introduces the name J into the program. It doesn't say where J, exi where J exists or what its value is going to be. And this is a declaration unless, just a non-defining declaration, unless we add in an initial value. At that point, once we provide an initial value, we need a place for that initial value to go. And that means this has to be the point of definition. When you forward declare an object T and put, uh, do T star in the header, is this just a declaration? Okay. Uh, yeah, this, that is your talk. Yes, you have declared a type that has just a declaration and no definition um, is what we sometimes call an incomplete type. You can create pointers to objects of that type, references to objects of that type, but, uh, but you can't create actual objects of that type T until you fill in the definition of what T is and fully define it so the compiler knows things like what size is a T. Uh, what's the difference between forward declaring a class and declaring it with extern? Um, the, uh, I'm not sure what you are, Thinking of, I don't, uh, so if you're asking, uh, this is a forward declaration for a class. It's a, it's a non-defining declaration for a class. Um, this would be a class definition. Um, if you're asking me what this is, um, that's not legal. I mean, that, that's generally not legal. You can do X during C like that, but that's, that means something else. That's talking about language linkage. Um, if you, but just writing the keyword X during before class, um, Unless I'm mistaken, I don't. I don't think that that's something that you can can do. Okay. So when we create definitions for objects, that allocates storage for the object. The it tells the comp compiler how it's going to acquire the store the storage where it's actually going to put the values for that object. Object declarations don't do that. They just introduce a name the actual storage location for the object will go elsewhere. So a non-defining declaration says, this thing exists somewhere else. It's not here. A definition says it exists, here it is, 
here's everything you need to know about it. We've talked, we've seen examples for functions and uh, objects, but the same distinction applies to uh, classes and templates. All right, there are different, let's talk about the build process. So you can build a program in either release mode or debug mode in general. Release mode being uh, the basic stuff that the program needs. Debug is the program with a bunch of added information to help you debug it while you're still developing it. I'm gonna be focusing on release builds here. Some of what I have to say will be relevant, I think a lot will be relevant to debug builds as well, but I'm gonna be focusing on release builds since those are the ones that actually contain less information. So in a lot of tool chains, in most traditional tool chains, C++ programs are built or translated, the standard refers to this as the translation process, in these three steps, pre-processing, analysis and code generation, and linking. A lot of people will just, will say compiling to refer to this whole process. They'll use it interchangeably with the word building. In some cases, I try to say building when I'm referring to all three of these steps together. Uh, some people, sometimes you'll hear people separate things down into compiling, by which they mean, they usually mean pre-processing, analysis, and code generation. These first two steps here. You start with a source file, with source files, and you end up with what are called object files, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And then a second step, which is linking. Okay, um, so the, can you give an example of why you, you would need the extern keyword? So to back up here, um, if I want the, if I'm creating an object, you know, we, we try to avoid global objects in general but sometimes we have reasons to use them. We hope that they're good reasons, but if I want to create an, a, a, to declare a global object in a header file so that it's accessible to multiple source files, then I need to put the keyword extern on the declaration in the header file. If I leave extern off, each source file will, will see a complete definition for that object J, and then it will, and we will run into a problem called multiply defined symbols, which I'm gonna, which I will talk to, about in a little while. Um, there are other places where you can use the keyword extern, like you can put it on functions. Uh, it's just, it doesn't add, uh, when you're talking about standalone functions, they're extern by default. Okay, so we start with our source files. Our source files are pre-processed individually. They're analyzed and, and have their code generated individually. Some people, were, by the way, some people call this second step here. Some people will refer to that as compiling. And, um, so that, that's something to be aware of. But when I think when I hear most people use the term compiling, I think that they're usually referring to you start with a CPP file, like up here, and you're ending up with a .o file, an object file down here. The object files are then combined by the linker to form our executable program. So What's going on? Uh, what are a.i, b.i, etc.? These are the names of what we call translation units. Um, I will get to that. That's the output of the preprocessor. I'll get to that in just a moment. So, so the first step, preprocessing, we preprocess each source file separately. 
What does the preprocessor do? Well, the main thing we usually think about is header file inclusion. The pound includes, that's resolved by the preprocessor. The preprocessor is also res responsible for resolving macros, pound if and defs, the things that begin with pound signs are preprocessor directives. Um, and so the main one that we use often is pound include, but there are others. And so the, when the preprocessor is finished, what you are left with is what called a translation unit, which if you were to open up a translation unit, uh, if you have one stored as a file, and we typically don't store translation units as files, but we can. And, you, and .i is the extension that I've usually seen for them on the rare occasions when they are generated, sometimes .ii. Um, but if you were to open up a translation unit, uh, what you would see, for the most part, is that the contents of all of your header file, files that are being included, and then followed by way down at the bottom, the contents of the CPP file that was run through the preprocessor. So the, the preprocessor's job in large part is to create these translation units. We care about it in large part because it's taking thing, we have shared declarations in our header files that we want to be available in many, different in many different translation units because they're gonna be used in many different parts of the program. And we want those declarations to be available so we put them in header files. All right, so the, the code generator, the uh, what we sometimes call a compiler, then analyzes each translation unit and generates code for it. The result, is what we call an object file, sometimes called an object module, but I'm going to encourage you not to use that term because it doesn't, it, we're now, we now have C 20 modules as a term, and object module in this sense is completely separate from those. It's more common to see object files stored. You'll sometimes see them have a .o or .00 or .obj extension uh, because. These, storing these tends to have the value of, if you don't change the source file, you don't have to rebuild the object file, which can save you some time. What's in an object file? Well, there's, some of it is data, that is stuff that's actually gonna become part of the executable program. Zeros, in a sense, the zeros and ones that are gonna be objects, function bodies, things like that. Other parts of it are metadata. And this is information that's being that the linker needs in order to take all of the different object files and stitch them together to form the final executable program. So the data is some, some of it is machine instructions, the generated program code more or less, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. And values, the actual, the data values for program objects, uh, in particular, statically initialized objects. The metadata, some of it is function and object names and addresses, information about what symbols are located in our, used in this translation unit, this ob in the object file. And, uh, and moreover, are the, does this object, uh, object file define something? That is, if, it, if this object file defines a function, then it knows what that function is supposed to do. And other, part, other object files that simply refer to that function might ask, where is the definition that I'm that I'm supposed to be referring to? And at that point, and the linker's job is to match up these definitions 
with references from other object files. Another piece of the, of the metadata is program section names. And there are a few different ones. We, what's sometimes called text or code is often the name given to the machine instructions section. The data is often split into different sections like literals, um, data for initialized objects or BSS for uh, zero for uninitialized data. Now I say the, the machine instructions are executable. Really, they're only mostly executable. Um, the some of those some of those instructions are going to contain external references, going to be trying to use entities that are defined in other translation units. And because that entity is in another translation unit, the code generator doesn't, doesn't see that other translation unit. So it can't fill in what the reference is actually referring to. It needs to put in a placeholder for it. And then it's the linker's job to really make the instruction fully executable by replacing that placeholder with whatever with the entity's address with the um, with a reference to the definition it finds in some other object file. Um, another uh, thing that makes the machine instructions not quite executable is that they're often designed to be meant to be relocatable at this stage. They're generated in a way that means they can be easily moved around. So the linker's job is to resolve the external references that between different object files by combining those object files, along with things like libraries of previously compiled object files to form our executable program. It may also do some other things like relocating values in code as it does so. When I say moved, when you say moved around, do you mean between different architectures? Uh, when I talk about the code being relocatable, uh, this is what you were referring to. Um, let me know if it's. Let me know if you were thinking of something else. When I say the code is relocatable, I mean that it is in the final. If you when you look at the final generated code, you will often see um, references to. Um, absolute addresses. You know, this thing lives at this address at, at hex 4000 or something like that. Um, when the code is relocatable, it's often uh, written in terms of relative addresses. Go forward uh, 300 bytes and that's where your next object is, or that's where the this other thing that you're looking for is. So there using relative offsets and things like that. Those are some techniques that are used to make the code relocatable. And some of those, uh, and in some cases, those uh, relative addresses are still used in the executable code. In other cases, the linker replaces them with absolute addresses once, it's, once it can see the whole program and knows how the different functions and objects are going to be laid out. Okay, so the one definition rule. So as a general rule, we say that everything, every entity that a program uses in a loose sense has to be defined. Now the standard says this a little bit more formally. It calls this the one definition rule. No translation unit can define an entity more than once. And certain entities have to be defined because, uh, because of the way that they appear in the program. And those entities are what we call ODR used or one definition rule used. Um, in general, things that we would think of as uses of something. Um, most of the uses are obvious. There are also ways of making something ODR used that might not be quite as obvious. For example, 
uh, virtual functions are considered ODR used just by virtue of being uh, of being declared and being non-virtual or, or and being not impure virtual functions, um, because the compiler can't tell whether that function is going to be used, going to be actually called or not until. Well, they can't tell that you, you have to wait until runtime to find out. Um, so the linkers job, at what point do compiler optimizations come into play? Uh, some of it, yes, uh, some of it happens during, during the analysis and code generation. Um, that's true. Uh, and I think that that's where, um, the that's where the the most intense optimizations are still done i think we also these days though have optimizing linkers so there are link time optimizations uh that can be done where the linker will figure out that because two pieces of code are now because it's arranged two pieces of code close to each other there may be additional things that it can do to improve the performance of that code. Usually the compiler is a little better at that than the linker, but it doesn't always have all of the information that the linker has to work with. Okay, so here we have a few different source files, object file, and we're talking about they're compiled into object files. So, a.o here has some declarations for th for x and y and f these are all things that are simply declared in a.o and they exist elsewhere x is defined over here in b.o so is f y is defined over here in c.o so when when we use those symbols, X, Y, and F over here that are just declared, not defined, these become external references that the linker will have to resolve. And so it's the linker's job to essentially draw these arrows and figure out how to connect the uses of X, Y, F, and G in this case, G being something that's declared in B.O and defined in C.O. It's the linker's job to connect those things up and figure out where, uh, yeah, what this piece, where this piece of code actually needs to be talking to to set the value of X, for example. When you assign this five, where is it going to go? That's something that the linker is ultimately going to, ultimately needs to resolve. Um, in general, the reason that it's important that we have that things be defined only once is that, well, if they're not defined at all, then the linker doesn't have anything to match up a use of a name with. You know, we're, we have a use of Y down here, but if we've removed the definition of y from over here, then there's nothing in the, then the linker can't find anything that says, this is the definition of y. And it can't match that use of y up with anything. It simply says, that's an undefined reference and you get a build time error as a result. Um, On the other hand, the linker could find more than one matching definition, which is also a problem. So here I've added a second definition for y to b.o in addition to the one that's also in c.o. And now when the, when the linker tries to match up this use of y with a definition for y, it finds two choices and it's not sure which one to use. So the linker will, will report back a multiply defined symbol and you will have to go and make some change to your program so that it now to resolve that problem. Both of these are ODR violations, as we say. In the final generated program, 
every entity is going to have exactly one definition. How you get to that one definition, though, is um, works a little bit differently depending on what kind of entity you're dealing with. So some things, non-inline variables, non-inline non-template functions, uh, these are things that have to be defined in exactly one translation unit. They must have one and only one definition in a single translation unit. This include uh, const expr and const eval functions are implicitly inline functions. Uh, so they're not in, they are like other inline functions not included in this. Only non-inline, non-template functions, non-inline variables. And a lot of people refer to this as the ODR, the one definition rule. Um, and they'll sometimes say that other things violate the ODR. They don't really, they're just, um, it, but the ODR applies to those other things differently. What are those other things? Well, class and enumeration types, inline variables, inline functions, function templates, class templates, partial template specializations. So there are certain circumstances where these entities are allowed to have more than one definition. Every definition has to be in a different translation unit and all of the definitions have to be identical. That is basically, they have to consist of the same sequence of tokens. Um, there are some other additional requirements that are, that are more esoteric and a little bit more complicated to spell out. But the way that we usually make sure we meet these requirements is we define the entity in a single header file. We put its definition in one header file and that header file is something that can be included by itself. That is to say, the meaning of that header file isn't going to change depending on other header files having been included before it. It's a header file that stands by it, uh, that stands alone, stands by itself. As long as these requirements are met, the final program will behave as if there's just one definition for the thing in the entire program. And there will be one definition for that whole thing. If you if the definitions don't meet these requirements, if they are, if the definitions, for example, are not all the same sequence of tokens, then you get undefined behavior. One way that this can happen is if you have an object file that's where the dependency tracking is off and you've changed a header file that that object file was in, that that object file used to bit it was that was part of the translation unit that it was compiled into the object file um, but for some reason that this dependency isn't caught and you try to reuse an old version of the object file after changing the header file and the reason that you get undefined behavior is these are very hard requirements to verify. So the standard doesn't require that you that the tool chain do so, and most don't. So how does the linker resolve these symbols for things that are usually uh, defined in header files? Earlier we talked about the the fact that it's important for something to have only one definition so that the linker can, match up each has a specific definition definition to use to associate with each use of that entity. Well, um, the, the standard doesn't say exactly how this works, but there are but there are some common approaches that people use. Um, the code generator record is recording, some metadata information about the definitions and declarations that it encounters as it's generating the code for an object file. So one solution that several tool chains use is when, you, when they see entities that are typically declared or typically defined in header files, things like classes, like classes inline functions, function templates, 
they generate slightly different metadata for those entities. And that extra metadata helps the linker identify and remove duplicate definitions because different multiple .o files may contain a definition. It's now the linker's responsibility to narrow that down to just one. So for example, if you look at visual object files generated from Visual Studio, you'll see that it marks some of these entities inline functions, function templates with a flag that says pick any. And that tells the, that's a way of telling the linker that at link time, it may encounter multiple definitions for this entity. And it, the linker can simply choose one and discard the rest. It's free to assume that they're all the same. And if they're not all the same, you get undefined behavior. Some people call these things weak symbols. Now, I'm using that term loosely because um, different tool chains use the term weak symbols in different ways. And, um, and they, there are slight differences, and in some cases, not so slight differences between uh, between what one tool chain calls a weak symbol and the other one. So if you search online, you will find a lot of people who talk about these things, inline functions, function templates as generating weak symbols. And you'll also find a fair number of people saying, no, 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 that's not a weak symbol. This other thing is a weak symbol. So that's the guidance that I can give you there. Okay. So on dealing with templates, we typically, um, oh, I see the question was asked a little while ago. Uh, I recall hearing that the preprocessor is very unpopular and people want to minimize its involvement. Is that because of macros? Um, there are a few different reasons, um, but macros are certainly a common one. Um, macros, uh, it's easier to write a macro that will misbehave than to write an equivalent inline function that will misbehave in many cases. That's certainly one situation, but there are others. Uh, the preprocessor is responsible for generating these translation units. Um, one of the reasons that C20 modules are so are such an interesting uh, prospect for so many people is that um, it's expected that, that if you're using a project that's module-based rather than source file and header file-based, uh, your, um, that's going to have very different build time characteristics. It may be, some things will be much more efficient to build using the modules approach than they are building on, under the, uh, the more traditional build model. Um, yeah. uh, okay, so we typically define templates in header files. So we have our, here's a class template definition for a class foo, single template type argument T, Here's a member function declaration. Uh, and we define the member functions in, that, in the same header file as the class template itself. All right, explicit template specializations, however, where we fill in a specific type for the template and say, foo is, when we use the template foo, and the type is, and the type T is int. When we say, this is a way of saying foo of int is something special. It's different from all, don't follow the normal recipe that is used to, that you can think of a template as a recipe. It's a way of, it's not a type, it's a way of creating types. It's a recipe for baking new types um, all using certain 
rules. <clears throat> An explicit template specialization is singling out uh, a set of arguments and say, instead of using the usual recipe that the template provides, the primary template, make this, this class, foo of int, should be something else instead. And when we write explicit template specializations like this, where t, where the value for t is fully specified, we put the member function definitions in the source file, typically, like we would for non-inline functions non -fun and non-template functions. So what makes them different? Well, as I was saying, a function template isn't really a function. It's a recipe for generating functions. It's a, um, when the, as you use the function template at different places in your code, the compiler will recognize how the function is being used, which type arguments are being passed in for T or the other template parameters, and it will generate code for each specific set of template arguments that are used in the code. Same thing for class templates. It's not a single class. It's a way of generating lots of different classes that follow the same basic model, that all have the same basic structure. Um, and that's true of, temp of template entities like variable templates as well. It's also true for partially specialized templates as well as the primary templates. But explicit template specializations aren't actually recipes for generating entities. When we say that when we're creating foo of int here, we're specifying foo of int looks like this. Don't here is the definition. You don't need to generate it off of, the re off of a recipe or anything like that. I'm giving you the definition right here. So an explicitly specialized class template is a single class. It's not really a template. It's not something that's used to generate new classes. It is itself a single template, a single class an explicitly specialized function template is a single function. You just have to act, you just happen to access them through the template syntax using the angle brackets. But the language rules that underlie how it's treated and what goes where in terms of when you place its declarations versus definitions, it behaves a lot more like a non-template class. So here. We have our, so this is another, back here I was showing you a, an explicit class specialization where all of foo of int was different and had its own special uh, form. Here, we have a primary class template for foo, takes a template argument of type t, but the member function f specifically should be something we want to define explicitly for the template parameter when t is int. This is also an explicit template specialization. Spells out exactly what this function should do for this template ar uh, for this template type argument. And we and again we put the definition for the member functions explicit specialization in a source file rather than in a header file because this is a this behaves like a function it's not a tool that we use for generating potentially several new functions all right usually the linker decides when you're dealing with entities generated by um, from templates. Uh, 
typically the linker is responsible for, we'll see multiple definitions for those entities and it's responsible for figuring out which one it's going to keep. And that can play into, excuse me, uh, that can play into uh, where the storage for those entities is placed. In some cases, you might need to control where a generated entity is defined rather than letting it, leaving it up to the linker. And we have a feature called explicit template instantiation for doing that. So I alluded to this earlier that code generators and linkers separate entities into lots of different program sections, text, text or code for machine instructions, literal for initialized read-only data, data for read-write data that's been initialized, so forth and so on. So if you see, you'll typically see that when the linker has assembled a program, there are different sections of the program that represent different kinds of you know, code or literals or data, or that is set aside to be used as the heap. This is what we call the program's memory map. Now, there are many linkers that let you control how they generate the, the memory map through linker scripts. Um, and this can be very important when you're working on platforms with multiple memory spaces. So I do a lot of work with embedded systems. Um, I've dealt with platforms that have both RAM and flash memory on the board where I wanted to be able to place some object where, where I wanted to be able to place some function definitions in RAM and other function definitions in flash. And that's the kind of thing that I can accomplish through the use of a linker script. But the way that the linker scripts usually work is they work at the object file level. You take, uh, by writing a linker script, when you do that, you take a piece of a specific section, one or more sections of an object file that the linker would normally have put in one place. So here, this yellow section was the combination of the two data sections from a.o and b.o was put in, all of that was put in RAM. By writing a linker script, I can change things so that the data portion of b.o is redirected and now becomes, is now stored in flash. But to do that, if I'm, if I'm want to do that for things that are template, that are template definitions or other header file entities where I don't know uh, where, which definition the, the linker is going to keep, then I have a then I have a situation a problem. How do I know which one of the what I should put in my linker script in order to whether the how do I know whether I say that I want to redirect the text from a.o or b.o in order to get it to the place where I want it to go if I don't know whether the function definition I'm interested in is in a.o or b.o. So, um, and we don't know because the linker eliminates the duplicate definitions for us and it generally doesn't tell us which one it keeps. This is the problem that explicit template instantiation exists to solve. We can write in, a, you can write in the header file, extern template, no angle brackets. Uh, you can write in the header file, extern template, no angle brackets, the function definition with a specific value filled in as the type arguments for the template. And this behaves just like a function declaration. We put this in the header file, and the function, the template function is now effectively treated 
for code generation purposes as if it were not a function template, but an ordinary function. We, uh, so when the compilers sees this declaration in a, sort, in a translation unit, it knows not to generate, the, not to instantiate this template for swap of int each, uh, in each source file. By writing this, you tell the compiler that it should, that in one of one and only one of the CPP files, you expect to write this explicit function instantiation definition, which is written the same way except without the keyword extern. And this says this is the source file where I want swap of int to be defined. Everything else, all other um, translation units should should rather than generating the function template themselves, should assume that this will exist and just insert external references to it. Uh, once again, this is an explicitly instantiated template, like an explicitly specialized template. It's a single thing. It's not a recipe for generating entities. And so it behaves more like a non-template entity. You declare it in a header file with the keyword extern. You define it in a source file, but you don't need to provide a body because the body comes from the earlier primary template definition. This tells you what swap of int is going to look like. This def this explicit function instantiation definition just tells you just tells um, the tool chain where the definition for that function template should go for that for that fun for the function generated from that function template I should say okay um, and the compiler will generate a single definition for the explicitly instantiated entity. And it actually does that regardless of whether or not it's actually used by declaring the uh, it to be explicitly instantiated. Um, you, you tell the compiler to always generate it. Okay. You can also explicitly instantiate individual member functions as well as entire classes. So here I've instantiated the class foo for int. When I do this, again, I don't fill in a class body. By ins explicitly instantiating an entire class generates a definition for every member of the class. Doesn't matter whether that member function is used or not, a definition is generated for each one. Okay, so now, that's I've said everything that I wanted to say about the behavior here. Now I just have some diagrams that will uh, that to go through uh, that show some examples of this in practice. So here we have a header file that contains a function declaration. That function is used in two different source files. It's defined in a.cpp. When we refer to, when we call the add function from inside a.cpp, this is, can be resolved by the code generator because the code generator can see this definition. It knows where that, that, that exists in the same translation unit. It can resolve it at code generation time rather than waiting till wind time. For an external reference, like this use of add over here in b.cpp, this is something that has to be resolved by the linker. Now, here, here as an example, we have a, an inline function that is not actually inline. Function calls that are actually inline, there are no external references at all. The code is inline. 
In this case, uh, we have the function that's declared inline is recursive. I've done it that way because recursive functions are hard to actually inline effectively. So here is the definition for an inline function in a header file. This header file is included in both a.cpp and b.cpp. So each translation unit will contain a copy of that definition. The translation units use uh, are referring to those, there are calls to that function that although the translation unit can see the definitions in each one, I call, I call this a pseudo external reference because the, right now we have two definitions at this at the point where I'm showing you. Eventually we're gonna get rid of one. And one of these things that was referring to an entity that was here is instead now referring externally to an entity over here. This is happening at link time. So this is the, it's hard to say that this is an external reference exactly. That's why I call it a pseudo external reference, but it behaves more like one into this situation. Okay. Um, I have a few more examples that um, here for class templates, but I believe that we are out of time. So uh, I will make sure that these slides are available. But for in large part, when you're dealing with templates, we have the same situation of each translation unit gets its own definition of function of instantiations of function of templates. And it's the linker's responsibility to eliminate all but one definition. When we're dealing with explicit template instantiations, that's not the case because um, we've explicitly told the compiler that this is going to be defined in a single translation unit. Uh, and here it is. When this translation unit is compiled, the, comp the, uh, the code generator knows that this should be generated as an external reference to over here. Um, okay, um, that brings me to the end. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Um, yeah, I will, I will head over to Gathertown to take questions at this point. Um, but yeah, if I don't see you there, thank you for coming. I hope you find this useful and enjoy the rest of the conference. Good luck in all of your coding endeavors.